Tonight, we're going to start a brand new midweek series on the book of Acts. The book of Acts uh, consists of 28 chapters, and we're going to uh, try to cover as much as possible uh, to ensure that you receive a, a solid overview uh, of this powerful book. It's one of the uh, one of my favorite books in all of Scripture uh, because there are so many uh, instances of the power of God, of the supernatural, of the miraculous. And so, uh, this book here, uh, the book of Acts, it records the birth of the church. Uh, and it also records many powerful miracles uh, of the Holy Spirit throughout these 28 chapters. Uh, and although the book of Acts was written sometime between uh, 60 and 69 AD, uh, it is still being written today. Uh, of course, not literally, but the Holy Spirit uh, is still moving today, just like he was throughout the book of Acts. How many of you believe that tonight? How many of you believe that just as God poured out his spirit, just as the sick were healed and the lame walked and the possessed were delivered, how many of you believe that we can still encounter the power of the Holy Spirit just like they did in the book of Acts? If you believe that, give God a shout of praise. But who is the Holy Spirit? Is the baptism of the Holy Spirit still for the church today? Uh, are the nine gifts of the Spirit still for the church today? Uh, what is the initial physical evidence that one has been baptized, been filled in the Holy Spirit? These are all questions uh, that we will answer throughout this study. Now, it's very important whenever you approach Scripture uh, to do so with an open heart, uh, to lay aside any personal biases, any uh, traditions or uh, any preconceived notions that we might have, maybe uh, based on your background, based on your upbringing, uh, and just simply allow God's word to speak for itself. Uh, I believe that if you're saved, then the same uh, Holy Spirit, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, uh, the same Holy Spirit that inspired the scriptures, it says that the authors were moved by the Holy Spirit. And when you get saved, that same Spirit took up residence in your heart, uh, and he will guide you in all truth, and he will always do so in accordance with, with, with God's word. Now, my highest allegiance is to the word of God. It's not to a uh, denomination. It's not to a religious background. It's not to any uh, church traditions or to even certain influential teachers. No, your highest allegiance must always be to God's word, and anything that goes contrary to God's word, it must be dismissed. Now, let me add an addendum to that tonight before we really get started. Uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's not a Pentecostal thing. It's not a charismatic thing. It's not a, a, a Protestant thing. It's not a church of God thing or an assemblies of God thing. No, it's a Bible thing. All you've got to do is open up the book. It's all right there in front of you. And so as we make our way throughout the book of Acts, I really encourage you uh, to let it challenge you. You know, I think that there's really two different ways that we can approach scripture when we're studying scripture. We can either uh, go into scripture with these preconceived ideas and then try to validate our preconceived notions through the scriptures, or we can just go into scripture with an open heart, pull out the truths from the word of God, and then form our belief from that. And that's really how we want to approach the word of God. We want to go uh, go at it with an open heart and just say, Lord, speak to us, God, open up the things that you want us to see, open up the things that you want us to hear. And maybe there's someone listening tonight. Maybe you grew up in a, in a, in a background that didn't believe in the baptism of the Holy spirit. Maybe, uh, just like I did when I was younger, I grew up in a lot of Baptist churches where they did not believe that speaking in tongues was still for today. They did not believe that, uh, the nine gifts of the spirit were still for today. Uh, but God showed me something else. He showed me that the power of the Holy Spirit is still for the church. He baptized me in the Holy Spirit. And can I just tell you today, man came too late to tell me that God isn't real. Man came too late to tell me that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is no longer for the church. Man came too late to tell me that the nine gifts of the Spirit ceased at the times when the early apostles passed away or when the canon of scripture was completed. All of that is still for uh, the church today. And so we're going to primarily go verse by verse throughout this study. But really, we want you to, to leave each service with, with fresh insight to the scriptures. 
you know, one thing that I had to learn early on in ministry, sometimes when you're preaching, sometimes when you're teaching, uh, maybe you reflect back on your, your teaching and your message and you're like, man, I wish I would have worded that differently. I wish I would have been uh, a lot clearer in that area. Maybe I, I could have been a little bit more articulate and when I was trying to convey that point. But, you know, finally, you just kind of come to a point where you got to say to yourself, as long as I left God's people off with the truth, maybe uh, something that they had not seen before, or maybe God just renewed, refreshed them. Uh, then that's enough for me. That's really what I want. At the end of the day, by the time you leave each service, I want you to be encouraged in the word of God. I want the Lord to help me bring fresh insight to you, to bring a, a renewing in your heart. And so that's what we're hoping for. And so we're going to go primarily verse by verse. Uh, there will probably be some sections of the book of Acts because it's uh, 28 chapters. We're probably going to uh, summarize certain parts of it just for the, the sake of keeping uh, our flow. But uh, as we have gone through many different books of the Bible. We've been studying all sorts of different uh, books, verse by verse. We've gone through First and Second Timothy. We've gone through Titus. We've gone through all these different books, and and of, of course, our studies they're not exhaustive, and there's always going to be uh, so much more that we could teach on and so much more that we could expound on. But really our attempt is to really uh, teach the scriptures as straightforward as possible uh, so that really you, you retain the most essential uh, and foundational doctrines throughout these books. And so here in this book, we're going to see uh, when God first pours out his spirit uh, into the church. We're going to see many instances of the supernatural, uh, of the miraculous. But, you know, my desire when we go through this book, uh, the book of Acts, my desire is that you would not just see it from a, a historical perspective because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, and so what he did back then in the, in the book of Acts, uh, he's still wanting to do today. I remember hearing a prophecy years ago when the prophecy was this, read the book of Acts and get ready. That was the message. Read the book of Acts and get ready because God is the same God that he's always been. And, and Jesus said, greater things shall you see. And so I hope that when we go through this book, you don't just say, man, that was really awesome that God did that back then, but rather that it would build faith in your heart today yeah. to believe God for the supernatural, to believe God for the miraculous, to, to say, Lord, use me to walk in your power, to walk in the presence of the Holy Spirit, to see souls saved, to see lives transformed, to see the sick healed, to see the possessed delivered, to see those that are bound and broken, set free by the power of God. I really hope that it stirs up faith because because faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? the word of God. And so when we go through the word of God, you have the opportunity to reach out by faith and God will build that faith on the inside of your heart. God said in Malachi chapter three and verse 10 to, to put him to the test, to try him. And so God wants us to test him in a good way. God wants you to step out in faith and believe him uh, for the supernatural. And so he's still a miracle working God and he's still working miracles amongst his people. And so as we begin this study, let, let's pray and welcome the Holy Spirit uh, to bring fresh transformative insight to our lives. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your word tonight, God. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit, Lord. You said that you would not leave us as orphans, oh God. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you sent us another, that you sent us a comforter. You sent us the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we welcome your spirit throughout this study, Lord. We pray, God, that you would anoint our eyes to see that which you want us to see, Lord. That you would help us to open up our hearts to what you want to speak to us. And Lord, we thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said amen and amen. As we like to do with each study, with, with each book that we break down, we really like to first give you some background to contextualize our, our teaching. And so they can put that first slide up there because uh, for some of you, it might be hard to read, but this is just encouragement for you to sit up closer. Amen. Uh, but this uh, just kind of gives some background. Don't worry, I'll read it if you can't see it. Uh, but the author of the book of Acts, of course, was Luke. Uh, Luke was a physician. Uh, now, Luke was actually the only Gentile writer of the Word of God. I heard a preacher say the other day that 
all of scripture, all of scripture uh, was written by Jewish people. Technically, that's not the case. Luke, he was a Gentile. Uh, he's the only Gentile, Gentile writer of scripture. Uh, and this book was written sometime between 60 and 69 AD. Again, it was written sometime between 60 and 69 AD. As I mentioned, Luke, he was a a physician, uh, and he was also a a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. He traveled with Paul. uh, In those days, it was very different. Uh, You know, if you're a doctor today, if you're a physician, there's kind of some clout that comes with that. Back then, it was different. You were basically a slave. Uh, Many people that were wealthier, they had a a personal uh, physician, Uh, and so Luke, was a physician, uh, and the book of Luke uh, and the book of Acts was both written by by the same Luke, Uh, but another thing to mention is that they were both addressed to uh, Theophilus. You see that in the beginning of the book of Luke. You also see that here in the book of Acts, that it was written to somebody by the name of Theophilus. Now, uh, there's some debate as to uh, who and, and what Theophilus uh, is, uh, but it's really one of two things. I put them up on the screen here, uh, but it was either Luke's employer, because as I mentioned, as a physician uh, in that day, you're probably somebody's slave. You belong to them uh, and, and you're basically employed by them. And so Theophilus could have been that to uh, the apostle Paul, uh, or, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, to, to Luke. Uh, but it also could have been a pseudonym for the church because uh, Theophilus in the Greek, it means lover of God. And so I think more than likely he was speaking of a certain person, uh, but some people think again, that it was a pseudonym uh, just to describe the church uh, speaking of the lovers of God, speaking of all uh, believers. But this book here, the book of Acts, it's uh, referred to as the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, But really a better title for this book would be the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. Uh, Again, it's referred to as the Acts of the Apostles, but uh, it really could be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles, or you could say the Acts of Jesus through the apostles. He can go ahead and put up uh, that second slide there. Uh, The book of Acts, it's it's a book about the Holy Spirit and about the church. Now, the word Holy Spirit uh, is referenced in some form or fashion about 57 times throughout the book of Acts. Again, the word, the, the words Holy Spirit are referenced around 57 times in the book of Acts. Now, now who is uh, the Holy Spirit? I think that uh, because this book uh, focuses a lot on the Holy Spirit, I think that we should spend some time talking about the Holy Spirit. Uh, but the Holy Spirit, he's a real being. He's the third person of the Trinity. Uh, the Bible displays God as one God revealed in three different persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit, he's not an elect- he's not electricity. Uh, he's not a thing. He's not an it. Uh, he's not mere hype or emotion or you know, goosebumps. No, the Holy Spirit is a person. In fact, Jesus, he uses personal pronouns about the Holy Spirit back when pronouns actually meant something. Jesus, he he used different personal pronouns about the Holy Spirit. You see that in John chapter 14. If you go to John chapter 14, beginning in verse 16, Jesus said, and I will pray the father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Again, you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. And so you see Jesus using a a personal pronoun when referring to the Holy Spirit. And so uh, again, the Holy Spirit, he's not in it. I know some people think that the Holy Spirit's like in an electrical current. Uh, You know, I shared that service, you know, uh, shared about that service I went to where, you know, this preacher had everybody line up and told everyone to hold hands and not let go. Because if these people get touched by God, then these people get touched by God. And if these people get touched by God, then those people get touched by God. And, and, you know, that was all like, you know, like an electrical current. But that's not the, that's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. Uh, The Holy Spirit, uh, he's a third member of the Trinity. uh, And so Jesus referred to him as as a person and, and he has all of the attributes of 
of uh, personality. And I put those up there uh, because the three things that make uh, one a person is that they have a mind, that they have a will, and that they have emotion. Again, so again the three attributes of personality is mind, will, and emotion. We know that the Holy Spirit has a mind because in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11, it says, for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. And so we know that the Holy Spirit has a mind. The Holy Spirit knows. Secondly, uh, the Holy Spirit has a will. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11, it says, but one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Of course, in the context there, Paul, he was talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit, he distributes them as he wills. And so the Holy Spirit has a will. Number three, the Holy Spirit has emotion because we see in Ephesians chapter four and verse 30, it says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Again, do not grieve the Spirit of God. So the Holy Spirit, he has a mind, the Holy Spirit has a will, and the Holy Spirit has emotion. And so therefore, uh, the Holy Spirit is a person. Now he can put up the third slide there. Uh, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit has always existed being co-equal and co-eternal with God. Again, the Holy Spirit has always existed being co-equal and co-eternal with God. In fact, he was there at creation in Genesis chapter one and verse two, it says, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was, up, was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Uh, we know that the Holy Spirit, he empowered specific individuals uh, in the Old Testament. Moses, he was filled with the spirit. Gideon and, and Samson and David, just to, just to mention a few, uh, they were filled with with the spirit of God. Now, the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is what we see in the book of Acts. And it, it's here uh, on the screen here, which is letter C, that the Holy Spirit, he became available uh, to all believers uh, at the time of Pentecost. And so it's not that the Holy Spirit just suddenly uh, shows up on the world scene here in the book of Acts, but uh, back in the Old Testament, he would come upon certain individuals. Uh, the Holy Spirit, he would come upon an individual to complete a specific task. But once that task was completed, the Holy Spirit had to remove himself because the debt of sin had not been paid. And so the Holy Spirit could come upon somebody, but he could not reside within us until our sins had been atoned for. And so he would come upon prophets and he would come upon kings and he would come upon craftsmen and come upon preachers uh, to complete a, a specific work, but then the spirit of God would have to remove himself. But on the day of Pentecost, which we're going to see in Acts chapter two, the Holy Spirit was then made available to all believers for anybody who will believe they can receive the power of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will not just come upon you, but the the Holy Spirit will reside in you. And so we're going to be talking uh, more about that. He can put up the next slide there because uh, the book of Acts, uh, it doesn't, it's not just about the Holy Spirit, uh, but it's also about the church. And so uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, well, first I'll mention what I put up there, uh, that the word church is actually mentioned about 20 times in the book of Acts. Uh, and, and it's a Greek word, ekklesia, which simply means the called out ones. And that's the real literal definition of the church. Uh, it's the called out ones. Many people view the church as a church building or a denomination or a group of people, but the universal body of Christ that goes far beyond any denomination, any organization, any movement, any church, the, the, the church, it speaks of those who have been called out. How many of you know that we've been called to be separate from the world? We've been called out to be different. Uh, and distinct. And so uh, what we're going to see here is we're going to see the birth of the church. Uh, and really the church begins 
when Jesus ascends, and really what he does is he hands the baton of ministry uh, to the, the believers uh, to reach a lost and a dying world. And so the Holy Spirit, he comes and he empowers and he, he fills the early church. And, and subsequently, all believers of Christ, we are now an extension of Christ's ministry in the world. And so the church began when Jesus' earthly ministry was completed. Complete, uh, completed when he ascended to heaven, he passed the baton unto the church, unto the believers. And so now we are the hands and feet of Jesus. Now we are carrying out the ministry of Jesus. And that's when uh, the church is going to begin here in the book of Acts. We're also going to see the second thing on the list here uh, is the growth of the church. And I have in parentheses, numerically and spiritually, uh, we're going to see that from the very beginning on the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that 3,000 people got saved just in one day. And so that's some of the numerical growth, but then they're going to continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And they're going to go out in the power of the Holy Spirit, and they're going to preach the word of God uh, and spread the gospel. We're also going to see the third thing on here, the unity of the church. Uh, the Bible will say that they were all uh, in one accord. They were uniting around the, the common mission of the gospel to go into all the world and reach the lost. I believe that if we're going to be effective in the world today as the church, as the called out ones as the body of Christ, then we need to have unity. And, and sometimes that means setting aside insignificant differences, things that really have no bearing on the gospel, things that really won't help reach the lost, set those things aside so that we can come in unity of the truth so that we can be most effective for the kingdom of God. And then the fourth thing we're going to see uh, is the power in the church. And that word uh, power that we're going to be looking at, it's a Greek word dunamis, uh, which is mentioned 12 times in the book of Acts. Uh, and dunamis, of course, is where we get the word dynamite. It's the same uh, root word. And so God, he wants to do some, some explosive, powerful things in the life of the church. God, uh, it's not his intention for us to be these uh, weak, weary believers. No, he wants you to be full of the power of the spirit. He sent the power of the Holy Spirit to equip you so that you could be an effective witness for him. So you can stand up and boldly proclaim the word of God, even in the face of, of opposition and persecution, even in the midst of tribulation, that supernatural power is to give you boldness to be more effective for him. It's a, a supernatural work happening on the inside so that you can accomplish uh, what what God has called you to do. You know, before I got saved, I hated talking in front of people. If I can be honest, I had no desire to talk in front of people. But once I got saved and I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, I wanted to stand before half a million people and proclaim that Jesus still saves. And just as he saved me, he can save you. Just as he filled me with the power of the Holy Spirit, he can fill you with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so that's the purpose of the power of the Holy Spirit is to give you boldness. You know, I like the, the saying, it's an unction function to function. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit, he'll then move you to, to preach the gospel. He'll give you a deeper insight to the word of God, a deeper passion and, and worship and prayer. And we're going to be talking a lot more about the power of the Holy Spirit and the benefits of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but now that I'm through my introduction, I'd like to begin uh, in chapter one and verse one. <laughs> Chapter 1 and verse 1, and we'll read through the first 11 verses, and then we'll come back through and we'll begin to break them apart. But Luke, he said this, he said, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Verse four, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? 
And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power, but you shall receive power power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Verse nine, now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now you can back up back there to verse one. You know, this here is really the closing chapter of Jesus's public ministry here in the, these first 11 verses. Uh, I know oftentimes we maybe think that the closing of Jesus's earthly ministry is found in the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But really the, these first 11 verses here is really the conclusion uh, of Jesus's earthly ministry. Now he can uh, put up that fifth slide because one of the things that we see here uh, in uh, these first 11 verses, number one, uh, that Jesus remains on earth for 40 days after his resurrection. Again, Jesus remains on earth 40 days after the resurrection and his glorified body. And, and that's what we read there in verse three. In fact, if you go to first Corinthians chapter 15 and verse six, it says that Jesus even appeared to over 500 people at one time after being resurrected. And, and so sometimes we forget about that time frame between when he was resurrected uh, and he was uh, ascended, but there is a lot that Jesus did. You know, Jesus wasn't just hanging out on the beach uh, for that time period. No, he was, he was proving that he was the risen risen son of God, that he was the risen Messiah. He provided many, uh, proof, many proofs uh, that he was who he said he was, and he spoke of the kingdom of God. And there back in 1 Corinthians, it said that at one point, he even spoke to 500 people at one time. And so at various times over those 40 days, he gave many proofs that he was alive. Now, if you go back to that list, the second thing uh, that we see in those first 11 verses is that uh, Jesus reminds his disciples disciples about the Holy Spirit and their witness. Again, Jesus reminds his disciples about the Holy Spirit and their witness. And then the third thing that we see in these first 11 verses uh, is that Jesus returns to heaven from earth. So if you go back there to chapter one and verse one, he said, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to both do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now the kingdom, king, the, the kingdom of God, it simply refers to where the king reigns. The kingdom of God is the idea that Jesus is king and Jesus is Lord and that I have to submit to his lordship. And really Christianity is a life of surrender to the lordship of Jesus Christ. How many of you know that we are subject to the king? We serve and we love and we honor uh, the king. And so Jesus, he spoke of those things pertaining to uh, the kingdom of God. Now what's interesting is that in the next verse, in verse four, it says that Jesus was assembled together with the disciples, but there are actually several translations that also say uh, that Jesus was eating with them. In fact, you see that uh, in the NIV, in the NLT, that Jesus was not just assembled together with Jesus, uh, with the disciples, but Jesus was also eating with the disciples. Now, if Jesus has a glorified body, uh, then why does he need food? A glorified body does not need food for sustenance. But listen to this, y'all. When you get a glorified body, you get to eat for pleasure. Now, some of you right now, you are already eat for pleasure, but you should probably just be eating for survival. But in that day, when you get 
your, a glorified body, uh, you get to eat for pleasure and you don't have to eat for survival. And so Jesus, he's eating with them and he commands them in verse four, it says, in being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the father, which he said, you have heard from me. Now it's important to mention that that word command there, it was a military command. And so when Jesus commanded the disciples here, he said, wait in Jerusalem, tarry in Jerusalem until you first receive the promise from on high, until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus said, before you go out preaching, before you go out laying hands on the sick, before you go out and do missions, before you go out and do evangelism, he said, first wait in Jerusalem, wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit, wait for the promise of the, of, of the Father, because he knew that they were going to need the power of the Spirit in order to be effective for him. This was not a suggestion. Jesus said, you know, if you got some time to stick around uh, in Jerusalem before you go to Judea or Samaria, you know, it'd be nice if you could hang around. I've got something good for you. No, Jesus commanded them. He said, do not go forward. Do not step out into ministry. Do not try to do the work of God until you first receive the Spirit that is going to equip you to effectively do the work that I've called you to do. And so he commanded them, do not depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard of me. And then verse five says this, it says, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Again, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, of course, the Holy Spirit, he's going to come to the church in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. That is 50 days after the resurrection. Now, the word uh, Pentecost, it comes from uh, the Greek word pente, P-E-N-T-E, -E, uh, which literally means 50. And so these disciples, they waited for about 10 days for the Holy Spirit to come, uh, now, what's interesting is that they did not know how many days they were going to have to wait. Uh, they're just waiting for the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, wait for the Holy Spirit, and they just waited. You know, that's a lesson in and of itself, because so many of us, we want to hear when God's going to do something. We want to know when the miracle is going to come. We want to know when the breakthrough is going to come. And sometimes we just got to trust him. Sometimes we just got to believe him at his word, because if God said it's going to happen, it's going to happen. If Jesus said, you're going to make it to the other side of the sea. You're going to make it to the other side of the sea. The storms might come. The oppositions might come. The trials might come, but you can hold fast to his unchanging word. You can know that he's going to do what he said he was going to do. And so Jesus told the early disciples, he said, wait in the upper room until the Holy Spirit comes. I'm not going to tell you when. I'm not going to tell you how. I'm not going to give you a breakdown of what it's going to be like. I'm not going to describe it to you. I'm not going to explain how it's all going to play out but you just got to believe me. You just got to obey me. And so that's exactly what the disciples did. He just said, wait for the promise of the spirit. In fact, in Luke chapter 24 and verse 49, Jesus said, behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you, re until you are endued with power from on high. Now that word endued there literally means to be clothed. To, to be clothed with power from on high. Now you can see uh, in greater detail in, in John chapters 14, uh, 15, and 16. We won't go through all of them tonight. Uh, but you can see where Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit. And he describes in great detail the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But if you come back here to verse 5, Acts chapter 1 and verse 5. What you notice here is that Jesus, he distinguishes between water baptism and the baptism of of the Holy Spirit. Because as you know, John the Baptist, he baptized with water, but Jesus distinguished water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's really important to see that because a lot of people think that they're one and the same. And so if you ask a lot of believers out there, especially if they did not come from a, a Pentecostal or a spirit-filled upbringing, and you ask them, have you been baptized in the spirit? Uh, a lot of them will say yes. And then you ask them, well, what do you mean? They're like, well, I got water baptized when I was 12. And, and so they assume that it's the same thing. And some people think that when you get water baptized, some will acknowledge that it's a separate thing, but that, that it happens at the same time, if that makes sense. And, and so they, they will say, yeah, the baptism of 
of the Holy Spirit is separate than water baptism, but yet they believe that they get water baptized at the moment, or, or they get baptized in the Holy, Holy Spirit at the moment that they're water baptized, if you're still with me tonight. But uh, although that can take place, I, I've seen instances where you're water baptizing somebody, they just got saved, and then God baptized them in the Holy Spirit. But what you see here is that Jesus, he makes a distinction uh, between the two. Now, the word baptism, it's a Greek word, baptizo, and it speaks of a full immersion, and it actually means to be overwhelmed with. Again, it speaks of a full immersion, and it also speaks of being overwhelmed with the Holy Spirit. The word picture there, the, the word picture there is that of a sunken ship. Uh, in other words, it's not just in the water, but it's fully submersed. It's fully immersed uh, underneath the water. And, you know, when you get saved, you enter into the water. When you get saved, uh, the Holy Spirit comes to and dwell inside of your heart. Every person that's saved, that's born again, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in their life. But there's a second work of grace that the Bible speaks of, and we'll have plenty of time to talk about it. But there's a second subsequent work of grace, and that's the infilling of the Holy Spirit. That's when you're immersed in the Spirit of God. You're like a, a sunken ship. You're like a, a spirit sponge that can't contain any more water. Uh, and that's the idea of baptism. It's a full immersion in the spirit of God. And so Jesus says, this is when you're going to be overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he does so in a powerful, overwhelming way. Now, I want to take you to a quick passage of scripture before we go on in the book of Acts, because I think it's important to uh, deal with this in John chapter 20, beginning in verse 19, because in these few verses, is you see an interesting thing that takes place, uh, and this is before uh, the day of Pentecost, and I'll give you my perspective on it, and I'll let you make up your own mind, but this is before the day of Pentecost, this is before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit takes place, but this is after Jesus is resurrected, and it says in verse 19, it says, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, I want you to take notice of that. These disciples, they were living in fear. They were afraid of the Jews. And Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. And then in verse 20, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Verse 21. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And then in verse 22, it says this, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So the question is, what is this that took place here? Because this is before we see the Holy Spirit poured out in Acts chapter 2. And yet Jesus tells these disciples, receive the Holy Spirit. Well, my personal view on this was that this was a uh, temporary endowment of power uh, based off of the circumstances that they were going through. They were living in fear at that time. And, and just as you see throughout the Old, Te Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would uh, come upon individuals for battle. The Holy Spirit would come upon David uh, to take on Goliath. Uh, I believe this was a temporary endowment uh, of power. There are some that believe that uh, these disciples at this time got baptized in the Holy Spirit like they did in Acts chapter 2. Uh, I differ from that view, uh, but I just want to let you glance at that just so you can see it. But if you go back to uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse 5, Acts chapter uh, 1 and verse 5, it says, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, as I've mentioned, this baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's a second work of grace. It happens sometime after you get saved. Sometimes it's right after you, after you get saved. Uh, there's some people that got saved when they were a teenager or a child. And then, you know, they didn't even hear about the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And then at 80 years old, they get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Then there's other people that get saved. Oftentimes when we're on the mission field, we follow up altar calls for salvation with altar calls for the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Because we believe the only uh, requirement to receive the baptism of the 
the Holy Spirit. The only requirement to be filled with the Spirit of God is to be born again. Uh, If you've accepted Jesus into your heart and your sins have been washed away, then you are then qualified to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, in in 1 Corinthians, and I I don't have the reference. It might be chapter 6 and verse 19. If it's not, don't bother putting it up. But the Bible says that we are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells inside of us. And, And so that's really referring to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When you get saved, you become a temple of God and the Spirit of God then begins to dwell inside of your heart. The Bible says that the Spirit no longer dwells in temples made with hands, speaking of the Old Testament, but now you are the temple of God. Now the Spirit of God resides within you. And so that's the first work of grace. That's when the Holy Spirit begins to dwell. But then there's a second work of grace, which is synonymous with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, And that's when you are filled with the Spirit of God. We're going to see it also in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, where they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, anytime you see expressions uh, endued with power from on high, baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, Holy Spirit came upon them, all of those expressions are synonymous with one thing, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And and so uh, it's important to know that this is a second work of grace. So it has nothing to do uh, with salvation. You know, you're going to see uh, also instances throughout the book of Acts where uh, they come across certain disciples, uh, certain believers, and they've already been water baptized, but they had not yet received uh, the Holy Spirit. So we'll see more throughout the book of Acts where it's a second work of grace. Now you can go to verse six. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked Jesus saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Yeah, it's almost like the disciples like take a, a left turn here. It's almost as if they're, they're not focusing on what Jesus just said there. And so he addresses that really quickly in verse 7. And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. And so what what the disciples are asking here is, Jesus, when are you going to rule and reign on this earth? And we're going to overcome the Roman Empire and we're going to overcome on the earth. And Jesus just says, the time uh, for that is not for you to know. Jesus says here that only the Father knows. And so he says, uh, don't be concerned about that. And then he goes right back to what he was saying. And, you know, I can relate to Jesus here because sometimes you run into to Christians that get so sidetracked and you've just got to, to reel things back in and say, listen, don't be concerned about that. Focus on what's important. You know, they're here, they're, they're talking about Jesus's uh, second coming. And Jesus is like, I haven't even left earth yet. I'm here. I'm trying to give you power. I'm trying to give you some power to be an effective witness uh, for me. He said in verse eight, uh, but you shall receive power uh, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And so he's saying, forget about my, my second coming. Uh, don't don't worry about when I'm coming back. Focus on right now. I want to give you some power right here. He said, but you shall receive the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts uh, of the earth or to the ends of the earth. Now, if you go to John chapter 14, John chapter 14 In verse 16, Jesus said, going back to that passage, I will pray the father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and shall be in you. Again, Jesus said, I will pray the father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. He said that the Holy Spirit shall be with you and he shall be in you. And so prior to when Jesus uh, was ever uh, crucified, Jesus was already praying for God to send a a comforter. And so he prayed to the father for God to pour out his spirit, for God to send another. And then we're going to see in Acts chapter two, when God actually pours out his Holy Spirit uh, into the church. If you go back there to chapter one and verse eight, Acts chapter one and verse eight, he says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, 
and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. But you shall receive power. Again, that word power there is dunamis. It speaks of dynamite-like power, supernatural, miracle-working power. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, I know that that word witness, you know, we think of it, you know, today uh, in our mindset, you know, just uh, testifying, sharing our testimony, you know, being a witness or, you know, maybe uh, giving your server an extra tip, you know, you, and you're like, man, I was a really good witness, you know, but the word witness there, it literally speaks of a martyr. It literally speaks of somebody that is willing to give up their life for the sake of the gospel. And these guys here in the book of Acts, they're going to truly understand what it means to be a witness because all of them died as martyrs with the exception of John. John, he simply died of, of old age, but they would all lose their life for the cause of Jesus Christ. And so being a witness is so much more than giving your testimony. Being a witness is so much more than standing up on, on testimony night and sharing what God has done in your life. But being a witness is being a martyr. It's being willing to answer the call, even if it means costing you your life. It means being willing to do whatever God has called you to do and go wherever God has called you to go to. And so it says here that you, you're going to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, where were they when Jesus was talking to them right here? They were in Jerusalem. And so Jesus said, you're going to be witnesses to me right here in Jerusalem. And then he said in Judea and Samaria, which were the surrounding provinces. And then he said, and to the ends of the earth. Uh, you know, you could say that Jerusalem is our Brighton. And Judea and Samaria are the surrounding regions. And then he said, and to the ends of the earth. And so I want you to make this personal tonight because God has called you to be witnesses of him. God has called you to, to live a life that leads people to Jesus Christ. He gives you the power. He equips you with supernatural power. And, and, and you know, you might be afraid to answer the call because you're afraid of opposition and persecution, but you got these other uh, countries. You got countries like Afghanistan and countries like Iran, where they know that being a public witness will cost them their life, and they're still willing to follow him. They're still willing to serve him. They're still willing to tell other people uh, about Jesus Christ. And so are you willing to do whatever you can? Are you willing to answer the call, even if it will cost you everything? Are you willing to be a martyr? Are you willing to be a true biblical witness of Jesus Christ? The power of the Holy Spirit is there to equip you to be a martyr for Jesus, to be an effective effective witness for Jesus Christ. You know, when I would go to murder capitals of the world to preach the gospel, I, I, I realized the, the danger in those countries. I, I realized how uh, serious some of those areas were that we were going. I remember we were in the number one murder capital of the world, San Pedro Sula, Honduras, and we got lost. And so we rolled down the window to get directions from somebody and they just sprinted away. They thought we were going to hurt them. But you know, it, it's such a uncomfortable thing to go to some of those places because you realize that, you know, how dangerous it is. And even churches and, and pastors, they get protection taxes put on them and they have to pay up to these gangs a certain time every month. And if they don't pay these gangs, uh, then they can lose their life. Their families' lives can be lost uh, or their churches, their businesses can be burnt down. Uh, and it happens pretty frequently. And some of them, they say, well, we're, we're not going to pay the taxes. And some of them end up being okay. Uh, and other times, they end up being targeted uh, by these gangs. And so it's a very real thing. I know that, you know, right now, thank God that, you know, we don't see the same kind of persecution in our nation like Christians in other parts of the world are facing. Uh, I think that uh, we're not trending in the right direction in that regard. We have a lot of imminent threats here in our nation today, but the power of the Holy Spirit is there to equip you to be martyrs for Jesus Christ. Uh, to, to fully surrender and submit your life to Jesus, even, even if it costs you 
everything. And so uh, we see here that, that Jesus has called us to go into the ends of the earth. And you think about uh, technology today and how we're now able to communicate the gospel so much uh, more, uh, so in a way that's so much more easy. It's a lot easier to communicate the gospel around the world through the technology that we have. And, and Jesus said that the gospel of, of the kingdom is going to go into all the earth as a witness to the nations, and then the end shall come. And the way that technology has advanced, and I'm somebody I like to I like to watch documentaries on technology and just the advancement of AI, and it's just insane how rapidly technology is increasing. But I believe that God is also using that technology to bring the gospel to people uh, that can't be reached. And I think that uh, there is a need for missions and evangelism still today. If a, if a church is not being active in outreach and missions, evangelism, uh, if a church doesn't even have a, a, a missions fund or some sort of missions program or a desire to step out or, you know, a way to support those who are, then I'm kind of like, what are you doing? Because that's what we as a church are called to be. We're called not just to keep this to ourselves, but we're here to bring it out to the ends of the earth. Uh, you know, I remember a friend of mine, his mother, who is Baptist, uh, she was complaining because their church sent so much money out for missions. And, and there, she said, you know, we should be using it for our city. And I'm like, well, Jesus said to bring this gospel to all the world. And, and, and sometimes uh, those in your own city, sometimes their hearts aren't even open to the gospel. And so God will send the gospel to those who are open. God will send the gospel to where uh, the, the, the fields are ready, the fields are ripe. And so we just got to be open to wherever God calls us, whether it's to reach people locally, whether it's to reach people around the globe. We just got to have the same heart as the disciples to ju just go wherever God has called us to go. Amen. A few more verses here. Verse nine, it says, now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Again, when he had spoken these things, uh, verse nine, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their, their sight. And so that of course was the ascension, uh, which took place on the Mount of Olives, which is uh, just east of the old city of Jerusalem. And in verse 10, it says, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. These were angels. Verse 11, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Again, verse 11, these angels said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And so what did the two angels say to the disciples? Uh, that Jesus ascended from the Mount of Olives and he's going to return to the Mount of Olives. So just as Jesus ascended from this place, uh, Jesus is going to come back to this place. And in fact, the prophet Zechariah, he tells us that same thing, that when Jesus comes again, after the seven-year tribulation, which will culminate in, a, in the battle of Armageddon, that Jesus will come again to the earth and he's going to overthrow the nations that oppose God. He's going to overthrow uh, the nations that opposed Israel. He's going to be victorious and he's going to end the battle of Armageddon and he's going to establish his kingdom on earth for 1,000 years. And after that, there's going to be a new heaven and there's going to be a, a new earth. And it says in Zechariah that he's going to return to the Mount of Olives. This is what it says in Zechariah chapter 14, beginning in verse 3. Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 3, it says, Then the Lord will go and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley for the mountain valley shall reach to Azel. Yes, you shall flee as you fled the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus, the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. 
And so the Bible describes through Zechariah that there's going to be a great earthquake whenever Jesus returns after the, bar, after the battle of Armageddon and that the Mount of Olives are going to be split into two, causing a new valley and that Jesus, he's going to establish his kingdom for a thousand years. And so those angels back in Acts chapter one and verse seven, uh, uh, Acts chapter one and verse 11, these angels are telling us what Zechariah told us was going to happen. And so these angels are telling these disciples in verse 11, he's saying, don't despair. Jesus, he's going to come again, but now they're going to leave the Mount of Olives and they're going to go back into the upper room where they're just going to wait. They don't know for how long they're going to wait for this baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's going to be next week's study. And so you can come back for then. Amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, God. We thank you, Lord, for your word, God. We thank you that you did not leave us comfortless, God. God, you sent us a a parakletos, one that would come alongside of and strengthen us, God. We pray for those tonight that are are broken. We pray for those that are weary, God. We feel. Uh, we pray for those that feel like giving up, God. We pray that you would comfort them, God. That you would strengthen them. That you would help help them carry on another day, God. Help them to take another step, God. Lord, I pray that the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit would clothe your people tonight, God. That that you would give them an unction to go into the highways and the byways, God. To take this gospel to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth, God. Help us to be effective witnesses for you, God, that our life might be a testimony of the grace, of the power, and of the glory of God. And Lord, we thank you for it tonight. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said amen Amen. and amen.